Today, I was eating breakfast as usual. Just like any other day, it consisted of a donut and a cup of coffee. While I was drinking my coffee, my girlfriend entered the room, holding today's newspaper. Hey Tom? Yes, sweetheart? Someone died in Milky Hills Amusement Park again. I choked. Isn't that the park you used to work at? I couldn't say a word. All those horrible memories flooded back up. Slowly, I asked. Which... attraction? The Ferris wheel, apparently. Oh no, not again. Maybe a little backstory. Six years ago, when I was 18, I used to have a summer job at Milky Hills Amusement Park, an amusement park owned by a cow and milk farmer in Maine, USA. The farmer decided to build a small amusement park right next to his farm after he won the Powerball jackpot. He assigned a former amusement park CEO to take his place and help him run the park. After all, he still had the farm he needed to work at. He placed a variety of attractions, including a roller coaster, a wild mouse roller coaster, a couple of carousels, some typical fair attractions like a slingshot, etc., and of course, a Ferris wheel. The Ferris wheel was located in the back of the park as it was added later during the time I worked there and didn't draw that much attention as it was still a regular Ferris wheel, which is not the most exciting attraction in a park. We did, however, have a vast crowd, including old people, young couples, and families with small children. The Ferris wheel had 32 cabins, each labelled with a number, but as I already said, it wasn't the most popular attraction. That's why the CEO, the farmer, and some of the more important staff decided to redecorate the entire Ferris wheel and, quote, change the formula. I was there during these meetings, as I was the main operator of the Ferris wheel. The concept the staff came back with was pretty cool, actually. Every cabin was painted black and featured big white question marks on all the sides of the cabin. The numbers were removed and the windows were replaced with tinted, bulletproof, I don't know why, windows. Nobody was able to look inside or outside the cabins. The next step was even more amazing. Every single cabin was assigned a different theme and reward on the inside. What do I mean by this? For example, one cabin was dedicated to gaming. Guests who won this cabin could play video games on a PS3 and TV that were installed inside. Another cabin was dedicated to reptiles and featured four terrariums with a variety of snakes and lizards. Probably the most famous cabin was the bed cabin, as the seats and floor were replaced by an enormous cozy bed. A lot of babies were made in that cabin, I can tell you. However, there was one cabin that I wasn't allowed to know what was inside. This cabin was formally marked with the number 22, hence the name. The only thing the staff told me about it was that it was the only cabin I wasn't allowed to enter or clean. I, of course, wanted to know why, but they resisted from telling me. They told me I would easily recognize it as the only cabin featuring its original number on the side, 22. As soon as the new and improved Ferris wheel opened, it took Maine by storm. It became the most popular attraction in the park because guests would never know which cabin and which reward they would get. Journalists and guests themselves made lists with the themes of all the different cabins. Cabin 22 was never mentioned on those lists. The first death was two weeks after the opening of the improved Ferris wheel. I was operating it, as usual, when Cabin 22 entered the boarding station. I was prepared, because people who entered this cabin always came out with fear in their eyes, in some state of mild shock, or even puking. 
The cabin itself was painted pitch black on the inside, but that was probably the scariest thing about it. I really never understood the buzz until that day, two weeks after the opening. The doors of the cabin opened and a man, probably around 30 years old, left it with slow steps and that strange look of fear in his eyes. He looked at me and stared for at least 20 seconds. I was starting to get nervous. What was wrong with him? Suddenly, he pulled out a gun, put it in his mouth, screamed, I'm sorry, Helen, I'm, I'm not strong enough, and pulled the trigger. The entire cabin was splattered with bone fragments, blood, and tiny pieces of his brain. I couldn't say a word. This couldn't be happening. What the hell happened to this guy? What happened in that cabin? What did he hear? see or feel to drive him to such a deed. The entire attraction was shut down for a week and after investigation, it reopened with cabin 22 still operational. During the investigation, it came to my ears that the guy who committed suicide had a girlfriend named Helen. Helen unfortunately died a couple of months ago due to cancer. Even though I was still shocked, I continued to operate it as the CEO doubled my pay for the troubles I had with this attraction. One week later, it happened again. Cabin 22 was at the highest point and suddenly I heard a long, loud, high-pitched scream. I looked up and saw the cabin dangling very violently like they were dancing inside that thing. A few seconds later, I heard glass shatter and a 17-year-old girl jumped through the bulletproof window. She fell a couple of meters down on her head, breaking the neck and crushing the skull like an egg. Again, same procedure. Shut down, investigation, reopening a week later, now with a warning for this cabin that only adults were allowed. I never knew what happened in the life of that girl to bring her to such a deed. But yet again, two days after the reopening, the cabin entered the boarding station. The doors opened and no one came outside. I went over to check and started screaming. The couple that entered this cabin 20 minutes ago were laying dead on the ground. Both of them had bruises and small wounds caused by fingernails around their necks. Again, same procedure. Conclusion, they apparently strangled each other. No further details were revealed. After that, I decided to quit my summer job early. The park decided to close cabin 22 for good. Until now, years later. For Halloween, the farmer thought it would be a good idea to reopen cabin 22 again as an extra. You guess what happened? Someone died again on day one. The investigation is still ongoing. I've talked to some people a few years ago who survived the ride, and they always told me they never knew what I was talking about, denying the existence of that cabin which is very weird if you ask me. After reading the article, the door rang. I opened it, and what do you know? It was my old boss, Mr. Smithers. Mr. Smithers was the boss of our section of the park. He was a good guy and acted firm but fair. I would often get lunch with him and some of the other co-workers. Even though I quit my job years ago, I sometimes still hear from him via mail or Facebook. He's still working at the park. As he entered my house, he told me he wanted to show me something. Apparently, he found an old series of DVDs. Each DVD featured a full-length ride of every cabin. One of them was marked with number 22. He asked me 
if I wanted to see the video with him. I said yes, even though I really didn't want to. We sat down, and he put the DVD in my player. A standard ride in the Ferris wheel lasts about 20 minutes. The first five minutes, nothing happened. Just two black benches and a black interior. But then... I started to see a weird shadow on the right bench. After a minute, it took form. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was my mother. It was my mother, slowly cutting herself with a knife in the arms, the legs, the face. Blood started dripping all over the place. I wanted to look away, telling myself it wasn't real but I couldn't look away. It was like my eyes were glued to the screen. Suddenly, Mr. Smithers ran to the DVD player and smashed it with his fist. The video immediately ended. Then, he ran to the kitchen, took a knife from the drawer, and rammed it into his own throat. My girlfriend, who was in tears, immediately called 911 whilst I was trying to stop the wound from bleeding. He didn't make it. All I can tell you is this. If you ever visit Milky Hills Amusement Park in Maine, USA, never enter cabin 22 of the Ferris wheel. Because whatever the staff did with that cabin, they did it good. Too good. I used to be a senior oceanographer at a respected research institute. As an old man with no family and my health beginning to deteriorate, I figured it was finally time to retire earlier this year. I've been waiting a long time for this, so I'll get straight to the point. In 1968, seven years into my time at the institute, I was overjoyed to be selected as a last minute replacement to lead an underwater cartographical expedition on a sea floor in the North Atlantic. I was one of nine men on our new submarine, the Captain James Cook, which we affectionately nicknamed the Cookie to save our breath and avoid possible confusion. Our mission was to chart a region of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that had been confusing some of the scientists studying it leading us to believe that it had been incorrectly charted. We set off for our six-week voyage on an ordinary spring morning and had no problems on our way to the destination, other than a minor engine problem on the second day. We reached the region by the end of the first week and began charting the region. It was pretty dull, just writing out massive amounts of data by hand with some accompanying notes here and there. So far, everything seemed in line with the earlier data. The first major difference was discovered about halfway through the mission. Coincidentally, on one of the crewmen's birthdays, it appeared that a previous, unknown rift was nestled between two mountains, making them appear to be taller on one side than the other. The sonar was still inconclusive, and the cookie was too big to maneuver into place, so we decided to investigate the rift close up with a couple divers. We chose the birthday boy and our most experienced driver to go look while the sub stayed parked atop a plateau on one of the mountains. Our radio malfunctioned while the two were out there, but they were tethered to the cookie so we just waited for them to come back. The only problem was, they didn't. We didn't have any more diving suits either, so no one else could go out and look for them. After an anxious two hours of waiting for them, we decided to reel in the tether, expecting to find them injured, or worse, dead. But what we reeled in was even worse than either. Nothing. 
The tether had somehow been cut only a few feet away from the end where they should have been. We hadn't detected any geological activity or large animals while they were out there, which stupefied us. The radio was still out despite our best efforts to fix it, so we decided to cancel the rest of the mission and go back home. To our horror, the engine also stopped working, trapping us on the seafloor with only 36 hours of air left. As you could expect, tempers flared as we desperately tried fixing the radio and engine to no avail. After a shouting match, one of the engineers stormed out of the engine room, only to vanish on us. While we were looking for him, we heard a knock on the hatch. This didn't make any sense, and we froze. Did the engineer find another suit and go outside? We checked the radio again to no success, and decided to let him in. I sealed off the entrance and unlocked the hatch for him, but he wasn't there. The first two divers came in and started pumping out the entrance. By this time, about 12 hours had passed since they had gone out, so there should have been no way for them to have had enough air to survive out there for this long. Not a word was said as they knocked on the entrance door, still wearing their suits. I stood there, hand hovering over the lock on the inner door, while two suited men stood silently on the other side, watching me through their helmets. The same one as before started banging on the door, still without shouting, and one of the crewmen whispered to me that there was no way they should have stayed out there that long without running out of air. So, I guess we should let them in, right? Asked my research partner, breaking the silence. Whatever those things are, they are not coming in, grunted a crewman in response. At this point, we argued under our breath what to do while the suited men stood motionless across the door. We ultimately decided not to let them in yet and to keep working on the radio and engine. For the next three hours or so, we nervously resumed such, while one man kept an eye on the two still waiting in the entrance. Someone went to check up on the situation at the entrance, only to discover that the guard and the two suited men were gone. Panicked, the five of us left split into two groups and searched the sub again. Suddenly, we heard a shouting from the other team, and they came running towards us. The bunks, one of them said, exasperated. And with the hair in his arms standing straight up, we went back to the bunks and found four skeletons lying in the corresponding beds of the four who were missing. The two empty diving suits were lying on the floor. At this point, I was terrified and knew the suit could potentially be used to escape to the surface. And worse, I knew that the other four still with me had the exact same realization. As I was in front, someone pushed me over and I knocked my head off a pipe and passed out as the others fought over the remaining suits. When I woke up hours later, I was gasping for breath. The air had almost run out. I looked up and saw my research partner and one of the crewmen savagely beaten to death, lying on the floor near me. The skeletons were still lying in their beds, but whereas before they were lying face up, they were now all lying on their sides with their empty eye holes intently fixed on me. I scrambled to my feet, and to my relief, they didn't move, as I was half expecting them to. I checked the entrance, and as expected, it was flooded with the outdoor hatch shut from the outside. I looked around the sub, 
And when I checked the bunks again, the two on the floor were now skeletons lying in their beds. With nothing left to do, I decided to down a bottle of rum and end things before a painful death of asphyxiation. When I was rummaging through the pantry, looking for all the booze on board, I found an emergency radio sitting on the top shelf. As fast as I could, I turned it on and started desperately trying every frequency. To my surprise, it was actually working, and I got in communication with a coast guard, reported my position and situation, that I was stuck and almost out of air, and they told me to remain calm and try to last until they could pick me up. Unfortunately, while they were en route, I passed out from the lack of air and everything faded away. When I woke up, I was in the hospital, recovering from the incident. I was told that it had taken over a day to find me after I passed out, and the doctors were completely bewildered as to how I lived. Later, when I was visited by the institute, I was told that the rift had turned out to be a perfectly chiseled out abyss with clean, straight edges. A depth reading had been attempted by ship after my rescue, only to read that the abyss went deeper than the scale could detect, meaning it must have gone deep into the mantle. I was sworn to secrecy and resumed work a week later on a new project. I was always completely stupefied by how I was able to survive, but things started to make a little more sense this morning when I got up and went to my bathroom mirror to find a skeleton staring back at me. I thought I was thinner than usual when I woke up. As I've been typing this, my flesh has been withering away into nothing, and now I'm little more than skin stretched on an empty frame of bones. So, I'm having great difficulty typing this now, and doubt I'll have any muscle in my hands in another 30 seconds. I feel cold. I think I'll end this here and crawl into bed. Be careful at sea. From 1962 to 65, there was a television series titled Truth or Tall Tales. The show was formatted similar to a talk show with the host interviewing three guests in front of a live studio audience, the only difference being that this was a game show. The three guests were contestants who would tell about their lives or experiences and the audience had to decide whether they were telling the truth or spinning a tall tale. If the audience guessed correctly, the contestant would lose. If the audience was wrong, then the contestant would win $500, $4,000 in today's money. Out of the 30 episodes produced between the years 62 and 65, one had been lost since initial viewing and has never been found. However, a transcript purported to be from said episode was recently discovered. It is reproduced here. Truth or Tall Tales, 1963, October 8th, host, Paul Price. Guest 1, Simon Cutler, brackets, truth. Guest 2, Jake Harmon, brackets, tall tale. Guest 3, Oscar Owens, brackets, question mark. The episode begins with Simon Cutler, a 34-year-old circus lion tamer who actually lives with the animals he tames, having raised them as cubs from birth. The audience said that he was lying and ended up winning the $500. Next was Jake Harmon, who claimed to be an airshow wing walker. The audience, however, didn't believe him and he lost. 
The final contestant was Oscar Owens, whose story was so unbelievable that the episode was confiscated a month after air. Price Our contestant is Oscar Owens. Please give him a round of applause. Owens, a rather ordinary man in his mid-thirties, walks out wearing a finely tailored suit, shakes Price's hand, and sits in the waiting chair. Welcome to the show, Mr. Owen. Thanks for having me, Paul. So, Oscar, may I call you Oscar? Of course. So, Oscar, there seems to be some kind of controversy with my producer backstage with you, especially pertaining to your story. Care to tell the audience what you told him? Sure. I told him that I am a time traveller. The audience giggles at this. A time traveller? Correct. Can I ask you, what year do you originate? Sure, I'm here to tell the truth, right? I come from the year 2025. So, roughly 60 years from now? Yes. And how did you get here from then? It's a bit technical, but I'll try my best to explain. I'm all ears, Price says with a smirk. Audience laughs. People think of the past as, well, in the past, but that's not really true. Time exists all around us. It's just that we can't see it. In my time, we can manipulate gravity, creating a singularity, a small distortion in space-time. When it was first attempted in 2012, it was wild and unpredictable. So to balance it, the team launched the satellite into orbit around 10,000 years ago. In a high orbit, this satellite has been floating around up there ever since. In fact, it's up there right now. The artificial intelligence on board acting as a beacon for us. Us? Oh yes, I'm sorry, I forgot. My organization, the Scribes. Scribes? Yes, the Scribes are historians who travel to points in history, pivotal points, to document what actually happened for future generations. I see. And your mission is to come on my show? No, my mission is about a month from now. Unfortunately, I miscalculated my arrival time, and now I need to wait for said mission. Can't you just travel back home and try again? Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Time travel is a very tricky thing to nail down. I'd equate it to throwing darts at a dartboard blindfolded. How so? The controller, the thing that monitors the timeline, is a quantum computer. A very powerful computer that utilizes quantum mechanics to do calculations. Even so, traveling to a specific moment in time is tricky. Anything can throw a traveler off course. Such as? Gamma ray bursts? Oh, uh, what? When a star goes supernova, it explodes and sends out twin jets, beams of powerful gamma radiation, like a geyser that travels so fast that they actually warp space-time. Sort of like space tsunamis. You don't want to get caught in one of those. You'd end up in the Cretaceous getting chased by a Tyrannosaurus. So, what do you plan to do in our time, until the time of your mission? Besides being on your show? Yes. Experience life in 1963. From what I've seen so far, it's pretty... relaxed compared to life in 2025. How so? Um, I see kids playing in the streets, couples going for walks on a sunny day, and people watching TV shows. Why is that weird? We don't really do that kind of stuff in my time. What do you mean? Kids work. Well, I don't mean work at a job or anything, but 
They spend all day inside on their studies, hooked up to the net. A uh, net? No, not a net. The net. The internet. An interconnected network of computers used by people all over the world. People watch movies, play games, chat with friends, buy things all from the comfort of their living room. Why? Because it's easy. Why go to the theatre or the store when you can watch a film from your couch and get good food delivered to your door by drone, flying robots? You don't seem too enthused about it. Why do you think I took a job as a scribe? While other people sit on their sofas watching boring TV, I'm learning and experiencing history firsthand. About that, your mission. Can you say anything about that? I don't see why not. It's going to happen regardless of what I say. Where is it? Where does this mission take place? Uh, right here in Dallas. Why right here? What's so important about Dallas, Texas? Right now, nothing. As I said, I'm early. November 22nd. Now that's a date people will remember. Why? Because on that day, a quarter of a mile from this very studio in Dealey Plaza, John F. Kennedy will be assassinated. I... I'm sorry? What did you say? John F. Kennedy, the President of the United States, will be shot in the head by a sniper and killed. That's not something to joke about. I'm not joking. The presidential motorcade will drive through Delay Plaza and a sniper who had taken up perch in a Texas school book depository will assassinate the president. A wave of commotion began to ripple through the audience as angered shouts drew ire at Owens as a live broadcast was cut. After a few commercials, Price, looking visibly shaken, addressed the audience both in studio and at home. Ladies and gentlemen, I offer my most sincere apologies for what the final contestant had said. During the break, our security escorted Mr. Owens out of the building, and the authorities were called. Unfortunately, by the time they arrived, Owens had left. When I started this program, I'd hoped people would not abuse it, but as we have seen today, people with negative thoughts exist. Don't let the ravings of a damaged mind fill you with fear. The president is very safe if and when he comes to Dallas. Unfortunately, Paul Price was wrong. 45 days later, at 12.30pm, Kennedy was indeed assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald as a crowd watched in horror. A crowd that included Oscar Owens, who can be seen wearing his suit. After the assassination, an unnamed producer of the show called the Secret Service and handed over all copies of the episode and documents signed by Oscar Owens. A copy of his driver's license was deemed a fake and no one by the name of Oscar Owens fit the description of the mystery man. All evidence of Oscar Owens was scrubbed from the records by the time of the Warren Commission, and to this day, no one knows what truly happened. I've gotten really into gardening recently. Maybe it's a side of my incipient slide into middle age, arriving a decade early. I don't know. I'm a real beginner. I'm definitely not cultivating rare velvet roses. I'm more at the toss a load of seeds at the soil and see what sprouts level. But I do have a pretty good idea of what my little garden can handle. I was browsing Etsy for cute plant pots a few weeks ago and came across an account that was selling nasturtium flower seeds. In case you've not come across nasturtiums, these are great for beginners because A. 
they do well in poor soil and don't need to be watered too often. B. They're really pretty, coming in bright red, yellow and orange. And C. The flowers are actually edible. Lots of gardening guides recommend them as good gardening projects for your kids, which, you know, is patronizing. But I'm into nasturtiums anyway. The seller was from Wales, somewhere up in the valleys, and they claimed they'd managed to grow nasturtiums in beautiful violet and indigo hues. I'd never seen anything like them. They looked like little watercolor paintings sprouting from the ground, if the photos were anything to go by. Claude Monet, eat your heart out. Not only that, but they were selling these seeds for free and buyers only needed to pay for the postage. The seller claimed they were the third generation of the breed, and the first batch to be made public. They wanted to see how the plants fared outside the stable conditions of the Welsh nursery. I know this should have been an alarm bell, but when I get really into a hobby, I tend to go full throttle, and I'm not so great at putting the brakes on when something looks dodgy. I'm regretting this now, but at the time, it seemed like an insanely good deal, and the seller had lots of positive reviews for other seeds and plants paraphernalia, so I figured it was legit and ordered from them. I didn't even pause when the courier service was one that I'd never heard of, something called widening Gaia deliveries. They were cheap, I got a tracking number, and I was able to follow my little seedlings every step of the way. WGD were actually weirdly detailed about where the parcel was. Your package has been signed for by our courier at Pentreth the Way. Okay, thanks guys. Your package is being loaded into a van and is on its way. Didn't really need to know that, but thanks. Your package is crossing the Severn Bridge. I did actually read somewhere that this is the quickest way to get from Wales to London. I guess nice to have it confirmed. Your package is at our Chingford distributing office and is being held by Beth. Extremely sucks to be referred to in inverted commas. Sorry, Beth. Anyway, it was that sort of thing. I figured WGD were balls to the wall customer servicing in an attempt to get more people to convert to their service from more standard couriers. I wish I'd given it more thought. I just really wanted those pretty flowers. They arrived safely from Beth in Chingford, unceremoniously posted through the letterbox. I didn't even see who dropped them off. I just got the notification. Your package has arrived. And after that, all I cared about was getting those seeds in the ground. I don't know if you've ever seen nasturtium seeds, but they look like little brains. They're a bit easier to plant than, say, wildflower seeds, which are tiny and get carried off into the wind if you're not careful, or sweet pea seeds, which are dense little spheres that roll away if you've got clumsy fingers. Don't even get me started on tomato seeds. Damn fiddly things. As you've probably noticed, it's April right now and it was March when this was happening. This means I'm only just planting a lot of my flowers, fruits and vegetables, and I'm not expecting to get anything bigger than a seedling. A little green sprout no bigger than my thumb putting out leaves for a few weeks yet. So, I was really, really surprised when the nasturtium went from buried in the earth to slouching out of the ground within a couple of days. A couple of days more, and I was seeing evidence of mature leaves, a strong green stem, even suggestions that a bud might be preparing. Again, just for the plant-free audience out there, this is weird. I only watered the Herculean seedling once in this time. They're not thirsty plants, and it was thriving. A few days ago, I went outside to look at my plants and spent five minutes pulling up weeds and watering and spotted that the nasturtium plant had developed its 
buds. A little rat green beak with the edge of a dark purple petal just peeking out like a tongue. I couldn't quite believe it. How had it grown so fast? I took a photo and uploaded it to my Instagram, an entirely normal response to shock. Yesterday, when I popped outside in the morning to do my plant caretaking, the nasturtium had bloomed. It was gorgeous. The colors were so bright, and my eyes were so bleary from not having had any caffeine, and for a few seconds, it almost looked like it was strobing. It was the most vivid and most beautiful thing in my garden, making the few bluebells that had cautiously put out their skirts look like they'd been bleached. Overhead, I could hear the indignant birds squawking from the trees, maybe stunned by the richness of the color. As I went inside, I saw my phone screen light up with a notification. I turned away to put some toast on and forgot about it, so I didn't see the next few notifications or even notice them. I'm not a mug. My phone is on silent, so unless the screen is in my line of sight, I don't know what's happening on it. When I did finally look, I had some new notifications from WGD. Your package has left the depot. Your package is on the road. Your package is temporarily held up at a church, but don't worry, it will be moving soon. The last one was so deeply weird, I screenshotted it and sent it to a friend. I pondered about it, ate my toast, totally failed to make any connection between the notifications and the plant, and went to work. Nothing especially interesting happened at work. I got emails, I answered them. A bit after lunch, I decided to spend a half hour just dealing with personal emails and social media stuff. I particularly wanted to leave a review of the nasturtium on the Etsy seller's account, as I'd never seen such a fast-growing plant, and I wanted to compliment them on their superior technique, and also ask what my nasturtiums would need next. The Etsy page had been deleted, and no matter what variation of the username I typed in, I couldn't find it again. What I was getting, though, were more notifications from WGD. Your package is crossing the border. Your package is speeding towards you. Your package is looking forward to meet you. Very reasonably, I thought, what the hell? And then, I can't quite believe this, I didn't do anything. I went home, I ate dinner, I watched Love and Robots. I didn't get any more yesterday, and I actually managed to forget about it. But I got some this afternoon, and I'm starting to freak out. Your package is getting closer. Your package is just a few hours away. Your package is walking, walking, walking. Your package is checking your address. Your package is close to your street. Your package will soon arrive. I don't know what to do. I don't know how long I have till this package arrives. And in my garden, the nasturtium is growing with this purple flower facing directly into my kitchen as if it's staring at me, or staring out behind me, expectant, waiting for something to join it. No matter what some famous authors may have led you to believe, the state of Maine is not entirely haunted nor is it full of vampires, demons, cosmic horror clowns, or any other monsters. That said, there's always some truth to a stereotype, isn't there? I grew up on the coast, and the people here are hardy, 
no-nonsense kind of people. Most don't go to church or believe in any supernatural nonsense. That kind of thing is just frivolous. So, when all the old people in town tell you not to go to a specific island and are cryptic about why, you listen. It was my brother's birthday last week, and I came home from college for his sweet 16. He gets really mad when I call it that. It can be weird coming home after being away for college. Everyone who never left is just still there, doing the same stuff they always did. Emily is one of the few people from home I still get along with, even though she's one of the ones who never left. She was my first real friend, mostly because she lived next door and we grew up together. Nate is taking me fishing tomorrow morning. You want to come since you're home? Emily asked at the party. Nate was my best friend in high school, but we've drifted apart since then. He took over his family's commercial lobster license instead of going to college. It's a legit choice. He can make a very good living that way, probably better than I ever will. He pulls traps all day during the season and drinks the whole off-season away. I just feel like we don't have anything in common anymore. Fishing? For what? It's too early for strippers or blues by a long shot, and the mackerel aren't in yet either. I asked her. I don't know, maybe haddock? Does it matter? She asked. She was right. It didn't matter. I think we're just going on the other side of Sag. I'm taking lunch. We should be back before supper. She said, and leaned into me for encouragement. I know one thing for sure about girls. If one asks you to tag along when another guy is involved, you should definitely go. She doesn't want Nate to get the wrong idea. Alright, sounds good, Em. I gave in. Great, I'll pick you up at eight, she said, before wandering off to find another beer. The party came and went, and I definitely didn't go to bed early enough to make eight in the morning seem reasonable. As much as I wanted to bail, I had agreed to go so I dragged myself up. Early bird, my mother exclaimed from the kitchen. I rubbed my eyes. She pushed me into a seat and started cooking. Greasy breakfast will help that hangover, kiddo. You're a terrible example for your brother, by the way, she said, ruffling my hair and pecking my cheek. I barely got the food down before my phone was vibrating. I'm going fishing with Emily and Nate. Be back later. I told my mother. Fishing? For what? She asked. All I could do was shrug. Emily drove us to the harbour and Nate waved us onto the boat. Hey Evan, glad you can come out. I've hardly seen you since you left for college. Nate smacked my shoulder. That's his kind of welcome. I'd been on the boat many times, but it felt a little different having only Nate at the wheel. It was his father's boat, and I'd gone out pulling traps with them often before college. I wanted to ask how he was doing since the loss of his parents, but it didn't seem like the right time. We passed out of the harbour and into the ocean. Sag Island loomed, a singular rock rising out of the thankfully glassy sea. The place is actually called Alawasaksaseg, but most people just call it Sag. It sits not far offshore, though no one from shore ever goes there. And there's no reason to go there, to be honest. Nothing there but a few wind-blown black spruce and a crap load of rocks. Even birds don't roost on it. At least, that's what my grandparents said when they told me to stay off it. Where are we going, Nate? I asked. He half turned to me, grinning. There was a twinkle in his eye, and he told me he was planning something. Other side of Sag, he said. The morning was cool on the water, as it always is this time of year, so Em and I sat behind the wheelhouse to stay out of the wind. She asked me how school was, and told me how the diner has been. We chatted casually beneath the sound of the boat's engine. 
when we crossed out from behind Sag. The air shifted, and it felt a few degrees colder. Soon, though, Nate slowed, and Emily and I stood to take stock of where we ended up. Behind us, the cliffs of Sag stood tall and close, closer in fact than I'd ever been to the place. From there, it looked even deader than it does from shore. It's a little more than a tall granite slump that's managed to rise high enough out of the sea to dry out, and it's just too stony for anything to want to sit on it. Nate continued to motor slowly away from the island and further out to sea. Eventually, he dropped the anchor and cut the engine. We found ourselves in a pleasant silence. He pulled out his poles and tossed them our way. Soon, we were jigging off the side. There's a bank down there. We're only in about 30 feet of water, Nate said as he adjusted his jig depth. We three spent the morning fishing and chatting. The air was cool but the sun was warm in the most pleasant way, and it felt particularly good after a long winter. None of us got even a bite, which didn't surprise me much. But the more we fished, the more I realized this outing was probably less about catching fish and more about catching up. We broke for lunch and sat in the still air, taking in the sun and enjoying each other's company. I was glad Emily invited me. I've been trying to get a seaweed farm going, Nate told us. It's easy work. Just get the seeded lines and leave them in the ocean. Then just harvest them when they've grown, he explained. That's a great idea, Nate. People are eating more and more seaweed all the time. I think it's going to be a big crop for Maine soon. We even started pulling some of it into the chowder at the diner, and everyone loves it, Emily encouraged. There's a ton of dulse on this side of Sag. You want to go grab some? I don't think we're going to get any fish today, Nate suggested. For a second, Emily hesitated. You can't land there, Nate, she said. It's not the kind of place you can anchor or swim to shore from. Not only because the water is cold enough to send you into shock in minutes, but the combination of extremely rocky coast and strong waves makes climbing ashore dangerous, to say the least. Without a dinghy or canoe, we weren't getting to the seaweed. I've got a spot, Nate responded with a wink. He pulled the anchor and slowly motored towards the island. As we neared, the boat began to struggle. It felt like we were trying to come ashore against an outgoing tide, but we weren't. I moved ahead of the wheelhouse and leaned over the gunnel. There was a visible current moving away from the island. I don't know where it comes from, but it's always here. I can anchor near the island, and that current will push us away from the rocks. We can just wade ashore, Nate explained, seeing my question. What is it? I asked. Some kind of tidal anomaly. Weird rock formation causing the water to do that or something. I don't know. My friend explained with a shrug. He was unbothered by this oddity, as if it was there just to let him come to shore. I was nervous as we grew closer and closer. It seemed as if we would be dashed at any minute. But Nate knew what he was doing. He dropped his anchor exactly where he wanted to and killed the engine. The boat nosed into the island as the current pushed against it. It never even came close to smacking against the rocks. We have to raid the rest of the way, he said, and promptly hopped over the gunnel, then splashed his way onto the rocks. Emily climbed over the side and dropped into the water. She gave me a surprised look, then trudged through the current up to the rocks beside Nate. I lowered my feet into the ocean and was surprised to find it warm. Not overly warm, but the water temperature this time of year is usually 40 if we're lucky. I waded to the rocks where my friends waited beneath the cliffs. Where 
is this warm water coming from? I asked, still shocked. I don't know, man. The weed grows like crazy out here because of it, though. Let me show you guys, Nate said, slapping my shoulder. We didn't have to follow him far. We clambered over the jagged shore, just at the base of the cliff. Here, the seaweed grew so thick, I couldn't even feel the rocks beneath it. It was like walking on an island of spongy funds. Emily inspected the stuff with interest. She pulled a few blades and stuffed them into her bag. Look at that, Nate said, shading his eyes. He pointed up above us towards the cliff. I moved nearer so I could see what he was looking at. I was surprised to find a pathway leading onto the island. What's up there? She asked. I don't know. Want to go see? Nate asked, already heady that way. I hesitated. This was sag. We weren't supposed to be here. Both my friends started climbing, and it took me only a moment to remember my adult courage and rationality. It's just an island. It was a natural path, not one cut out of the stone, but one that had been tread smooth enough for us to follow. We reached the top, and I turned to gaze out over the ocean. It was a rare experience to be that high above the water, at least 80 feet, with no other land in sight. I felt a soft touch on my hand and turned to see Emily. Dude, she said quietly and pointed. Nate was looking in the same direction. The top of the island was flat, with short grass covering it. It was a small place, maybe half a mile in total length. About halfway across there was a small wooden shack. We gotta check this out, Nate said. I thought no one came out here, Emily said. I mean, obviously someone does. We followed a path up here, Nate said, already headed for the shack. I was curious about the building too, if a bit more anxious than my friend. I wonder if there used to be birds here, and that was a hunting blind or something, Emily suggested as we walked. We found the shack to be larger than it had looked at first. The wood was weathered to a pale grey and dry rotted. Nate found the door and the handle was black and wrought iron and looked old. He pulled the thing open and to my surprise, it moved silently. Emily giggled excitedly and stepped inside. Whoa, she said. It was all the encouragement I needed to follow her. Within, I found what looked like a short stone wall built in a circle. My grandparents had an old well at the house that looked just like it, if a bit smaller. The story was that it was hand dug into the spring by my great great grandparents. I approached and Emily gave me a wary look. It might not be safe. Who knows how old it is, she warned as I chose to stand with her at a safe distance. Nate being Nate, he stumped right up to the edge. He peered over, then looked back at us. Dude, you gotta see this, he said. I took the last few steps and leaned carefully over the edge. The hole was dark. So dark, there was nothing to be seen. It was wider than I thought, at least ten feet in diameter. How deep do you think it is? Emily asked, leaning over it. She turned to look at me, and her eyes went wide. I felt Nate's hand on my shoulders. Then, the ground was gone from my feet. I tumbled over the stone ring and into the darkness. Air rushed around me, and I heard Emily scream. Her voice echoed within the well. Tell us how deep it is, I heard Nate shout 
followed by a wild cackle. That was it. I don't remember hitting the bottom, and I have no idea how long it took. I woke up slowly and in the dark. I was warm and wet, and the stones beneath my body were rough. My head swam, and I rose up on my hands. I couldn't tell that I was injured until I tried to stand. My right leg screamed out, and I collapsed into it. I started freaking out and screamed up into the well. I don't know how long that lasted, but eventually I ran out of energy and sat, gasping my breaths from the darkness. No one answered me. Before long, I calmed down and began inspecting my body with my hands. My leg was hurt badly, and I found a large lump I suspected was a break. I didn't find any other injuries, and other than being terribly thirsty, I felt okay. I couldn't tell if I was bleeding because I was sort of wet all over. There was about an inch of liquid around me, and it was warm. I could hear the sound of moving water. I ventured to test what I figured was water around me. To my surprise, it wasn't salty. It was, however, bitter and sulfury. I drank a mouthful, then decided I didn't need water badly enough to take my chances with it. What the hell happened? I ran the events back through my head as best as I could remember them. It had to be an accident, I told myself, though I couldn't rightly explain how. Either way, I needed to find out why. I felt around me for a long time. It was wet and stony everywhere. The wall seemed, to best of my reckoning, wider than the well above had been. I continued to investigate by hand, dragging my injured leg. That's when I found the drop-off. There seemed to be a levelish floor that I had landed on, but there was something else below me. I could hear the water down there. It wasn't loud like from waves, but it was definitely moving somewhere. It occurred to me that it must be where the well water drained off to. I don't know how much time I spent moving around the area over and over again, before coming to the realization that there are only two ways out, up or down. Up was obviously impossible. Even as I looked that way, I could barely make out the faintest ring of light from the top. Down it would have to be. At least the water under me was moving somewhere, right? I crawled to the edge of the drop off. I couldn't see anything but I found the hole was wider than I could reach. Gripping the edge of the rock, I lowered myself down. Warm water lapped over my feet as my arms reached their limit. I've never been afraid of water. I grew up on it. I don't remember learning to swim because I'm pretty sure I was born swimming. But at that moment, nothing scared me more than the thought of dropping into that unknown water beneath me. But what else could I do? I gathered my courage and let go. I splashed down into it and it immediately felt warm to the point of being overwhelming. It wasn't hot, but it enveloped me in a way that felt wrong. There was an organic warmth to it like it was hugging into me when I wanted distance. I dipped below the surface, then bobbed back up for air. I was moving, my wet skin could feel the air move against it. The water was taking me somewhere. I rolled along with the current, never feeling like it was pulling me under. In fact, it felt like it was holding me aloft. I noticed my leg wasn't hurting as badly as before as if it was cushioned by the river too. Light appeared to me slowly. It grew in the direction the water was moving. I started to hear waves too. That's also when I realized 
the tunnel I was being shuttled through was getting tighter. I reached up and felt the ceiling, and it was getting closer. There came a point I had to duck under. I took as deep a breath as I could manage and dove, pushing myself towards the now bright spot of daylight. The water carried me through the gap in the stone, and I suddenly found myself back in the world. It was a shock as I tumbled out into the ocean. The cold bit my legs, and I tasted the salt. I struggled back into the warm current and pushed up to the surface, and there loomed Sag high above me. I took stock of where I was and spotted the boat, still anchored so close to shore. I was alive somehow, delivered to exactly where I needed to be. There were voices shouting from above me. Suddenly, Emily tumbled down from the stony path, falling under the cushioning mass of thick seaweed. She hopped to her feet and spun around, taking a defensive stance. I struggled to swim against the current to make it to shore. Before I could get there, Nate emerged from above. When I saw his face, I knew what had happened to me wasn't an accident. It was contorted into a wild expression. Nothing of the Nate I had known was there. His eyes were wide and his mouth hung open, allowing his tongue to flick in and out nervously. One of the legs of his pants was ripped. There had been a struggle. He stalked towards Emily as she backed closer to the sea. Something bad was about to happen, and I wouldn't get there to help. So, I did the only thing I could think of. Hey! I shouted. Both heads turned to me. Nate looked shocked. It only lasted a half a second. Then, he grinned at me. How deep was it? He shouted back. As the last word left his lips, Emily took a chance. She flung something at him. A rock, I think. It struck his head hard, sending him backwards. She turned, sprinted across the rocks, and dove straight into the water. Her eyes jumped between her and Nate. Nate didn't get up. Em was already crawling into the boat when I realized there was a safe enough distance now between her and Nate, so I swam for the boat too. I heard the anchor chain clanking as the thing wound around its spool. Emily! I shouted when I got to the stern. She rushed to the back, and instead of helping me, she paused. The gaff was in her hand, and for a moment, I was sure she was going to hit me with it. We met eyes and communicated something unspoken. My friend reached down and helped me onto the boat. I collapsed behind the wheelhouse. With the anchor up, I felt the current pushing us away from the island. The warm water that had carried me to safety was now helping us again. We were home free. Then, I heard a shout. I got to my feet, unsteadily, and saw Nate hoisting himself over the bow. Before I could react, Emily was there. She didn't hesitate. My friend swung the gaff like a golf club, and I heard the crunch as it hit Nate's face. He toppled back into the sea. Emily cranked the engine, and we were away before we could speak a word. The wind had picked up and grown cold, but I wasn't chilled by it. I limped into the wheelhouse and rested against her. I was happy to find my leg was able to bear my weight albeit painfully. Call the Coast Guard, I told her weakly. She looked at me from the radio. I don't know how to work it, she said flatly. I watched my friend for a few seconds before speaking again. What the hell just happened? I asked her. She was close to tears, but held them back. He said... He needed me because 
he owes the island something, she told me. What? What the hell does that mean? What does he owe? I asked, confused and unsteady. Emily looked at me sideways. She knew the answer to my question. I have no idea, she said quietly. What happened to you? Emily asked, steering the conversation. I didn't know what to tell her. I think I broke my leg, I said. We didn't speak again until we were back on the mainland. The Coast Guard found Nate up there on the sag. Apparently, he climbed back up to the top and was just waiting for them. He didn't give them an explanation for what he'd done, but went with them willingly. People in town blamed it on stress and depression from his parents' death last year. That didn't sit right with us. I went to visit him in the county jail on Wednesday. They didn't want to let me in, but Nate gave his approval. I'd never been to a jail before, and the visitation area wasn't like the glass-separated ones you always see in the movies. We had about a two-inch wooden divider between us, and the side walls separating us from the other guests, like an office cubicle, but nothing else. Nate smiled when he saw me. Hey man, he greeted as if nothing had happened. I sat across from him and he looked perfectly normal, just like he always had. So normal, in fact, that he didn't even appear injured, even though I know Emily had hit him hard enough with that gaff to knock him out. What the hell? I said to him, more out of frustration than anger. I'd known this dude so long. There was no way he meant to do what he did. It was a moment of madness, and I wanted him to tell me that. He didn't. Nate leaned down near me without crossing the tiny barrier. You drank the water? He whispered. There was a guard standing right behind him, watching us closely, but I still felt uneasy. What? I answered. Nate grinned for a second. I saw that face from the island, the wild one. I know you did. It doesn't give its gifts for free, he said with a wink, then leaned away. I didn't want to hear anything else. Now I know he's crazy. Probably got hooked on something after his parents died. I decided I didn't have any more time or energy to waste on that wacko. I left without saying another word. I had an appointment with my physical therapist to go to anyway. It turns out I didn't actually break my leg though. And, if I'm being honest, I don't really need to see the doctor anymore. My leg already feels back to 100%. I work as a full-time fire lookout in California. For those who don't know what this is, basically, I live in a tower in the middle of the woods and watch for wildfires. For most of the year, I live in the middle of nowhere with my German shepherd, Sam. The only contact I have with the outside world is through a radio that connects me to the nearest fire lookout tower, about 70 miles away. That tower has a more powerful radio that connects all the towers in the area, while also being able to contact management and the authorities. I've also got my cell phone, of course, but reception is spotty at best and goes out for hours at a time, making it pretty unreliable. In other words, I'm pretty much on my own out here. That suits me fine. I've always been comfortable in the woods, and I'm not really one for socializing. 90% of the time, I'm left to my own devices. I spend a lot of time hunting with Sam, chopping firewood for my wood-burning stove, and reading. Pretty boring, yeah, but it was enough for me. 
It was quiet and peaceful, and really, that's all I want. Towards the end of my last stint out there though, it wasn't as quiet. This happened in the weeks before I left to take some time off back home. I started noticing it was off maybe a week before all this really started. It was small things at first. I noticed that come sunset, the forest got unusually quiet. The usual sound of birds and wildlife would die out. It wouldn't go completely silent, mind you. Just quieter than usual. I remember the crickets, though. They never stopped making noise, even when things took off. Then, I noticed the weird tracks in the dirt or markings on trees in the morning. Nothing really out of the ordinary here. I figured it was probably some animal, or maybe a backpacker hiking through the woods. Happens sometimes, but usually I at least notice if someone is around. It was hard to make out what made the tracks. Whatever it was dragged its feet, which makes the tracks a lot harder to identify, at least for me. The weirdest thing though happened the night before this all really started. It was late, maybe close to midnight, and I was up reading some mystery novel and drinking a couple beers. Sam was laying at the foot of my cot up in the tower, as he did most nights. I remember hearing a weird noise outside. Not that weird, it's the woods. Strange noises happen all the time. I would have just ignored it and gone back to reading. If it weren't for Sam's reaction... Normally, when he hears anything going on outside, he's up at the door right away, growling and ready to attack whatever it was. I'd have to quiet him down with a treat or something, and then he'd calm down and go back to laying on my bed or the floor next to it. That wasn't what happened this time, though. I remember hearing the noise, like a yelp from a wolf or coyote or something, but deeper. Being used to the usual procedure, I was prepared to sit up to calm the dog down from his inevitable panic attack when I set my book down and saw what he was doing. He didn't move from the bed, but his head jerked up from where it rested and his paws and ears perked up. He stared straight at the door like he was listening for something, but he didn't make a sound no sound whatsoever. I could swear it looked like he was holding his breath, but I figured that's just my mind playing up the situation. Regardless, that reaction was something I'd never seen from him before. I remember a cold feeling running down my spine when I saw him, followed by a sense of dread I couldn't really explain. I sat up in bed and pulled on my boots. The dog didn't move, didn't even acknowledge my movement. He just stared right at the door. My tower is basically a cabin with wall-to-wall -wall windows on all sides built on a platform raised up about 30 feet. There's a catwalk and wood railing surrounding the cabin as well, so I can stand out on the balcony of sorts and look out across the forest with my binoculars. It took a moment to look out the window to see if I could see anything out on the balcony. When I didn't see anything, I decided to step outside to take a look down at the woods. I grabbed my rifle on the way out of the door, an old Lee Enfield I used mostly for hunting. I figured if it was a wolf or something, it would be best to be armed, just in case. The dog didn't follow me outside. He was still just staring at the door on my bed. It was really starting to creep me out. I stood out on the catwalk for a few minutes and looked down at the forest below the tower. Nothing seemed to be in the little clearing the tower was built in, so I figured whatever was out there had moved on. It was when I started to go back inside when I first saw them. I had no idea what the hell I was seeing. It came with a sort of wheezing yelp. Hard to describe. 
kind of like someone had the wind knocked out of them and screamed at the same time. It was an unsettling noise that came with the appearance of a bright yellow light in the woods below. It was like someone had lit one of those electrical lanterns. More noises sounded out, echoing the first cry. A new light followed with each noise until the woods surrounding the tower were lit up like someone had turned on a set of spotlights surrounding me. I heard the scrambling of claws on the wooden floor and looked back to see Sam finally moving. He jumped off the bed, only to crawl underneath it and huddle up against the wall of the cabin. Still quiet, but clearly terrified now. I turned back to look down at the trees, and that's when I felt like I should have been following Sam's lead. They came out of the tree line and entered the clearing one by one. I couldn't get a great look from where I was, but I could make out humanoid shapes walking toward the tower. They dragged their feet as they moved, kind of like a zombie or something. I stared down at them in some kind of trance. I was paralyzed by fear at this point. Light spilled out of them. It was like there were holes in their bodies, and something inside of them was radiating outward to illuminate the surroundings. I couldn't make out their faces or finer details. I thought they were coming from me. I was terrified of what they were doing. I wanted to run inside and lock the door and hide under the bed with Sam. It didn't even cross my mind to fire the rifle. It hung limply at my side in my loose grip. When they were barely a few feet away from my tower, I thought they were going to start coming up the stairs to my cabin when one of them turned out of nowhere. It faced the outhouse that served as my bathroom. The tiny building had an electrical lamp over the door to light it up at night, and the automatic timer that flipped it on had just gone off. The thing let out a wheeze that the others seemed to respond to, and suddenly, they all bolted forward to surround the outhouse. They moved with terrifying speed, but it wasn't a sprint or jog. They jerked forward as if they were being pulled along by some outside force. They threw themselves forward, flailing their limbs and jerking their heads back and forth as they moved so fast that it felt like they were at the outhouse 20 yards away in barely a couple seconds. They crowded underneath the light and stared up at it, wheezes of what I can only describe as pleasure sounding out from the crowd. I was able to count out six of them as a light illuminated their forms. Previously, the lights coming from their bodies served to obscure them, like how the headlights of a car makes it hard to see the driver when he's coming at you at night. Now, I could see them in all their terrifying glory. They looked almost human. Pale white skin, interrupted by what looks like slash wounds where the light spilled out of them. The skin around these slashes looked like it was burnt black. They were all naked, but I couldn't make out any signs of extremities on them. They faced away from me, so I couldn't see their faces. At least, until one of them turned. For maybe a minute, they huddled underneath the light of the outhouse and made their wheezing noises. It was like moths to a flame. They seemed obsessed with the light. Then, one of them turned around and looked straight up at me. We locked eyes, and the most overwhelming sense of terror I have ever felt washed over me. Its eyes were massive, as big and round as baseballs, and pure black. They shone in the light of the outhouse as they stared up at me. I'd never seen anything like it. All of a sudden, the light bulb in the outhouse burst with a loud pop, but just before it did, I could have sworn the thing smiled up at me. A big, toothless grin that pulled a cry of terror out of its throat 
as the outhouse light went out. Right when the light went out, so did the monsters. In an instant, the forest below was bathed in darkness again, and it seemed like the things just vanished into thin air. I stood there, staring down at the outhouse they'd been huddling against for what felt like hours. My eyes searched for any sign of the creatures, but the dark building was silent and unmoving. They were gone. I didn't break out of my fear-induced paralysis until I felt Sam press his snout against my hand that still held my rifle. He crawled out from under the bed at some point and walked up to me. I jumped out of my trance and looked down at the dog, and he looked back at me, curiously. No sign of fear from him, like nothing had even happened to scare him. That's when I was finally able to relax a little. Still horror struck, but at least I was able to move again. I went back inside with the dog and locked the door, shaking with fear and adrenaline. I didn't sleep that night. Who could after something like that? I just sat in my bed with my back against the wall with Sam and stared out the window into the night sky until sunrise. When the sunlight finally came, I felt a wave of calm wash over me and the fear finally start to ebb away. I couldn't explain why, but the daylight felt like the last bit of light that was safe for me now. This wasn't the last time I encountered these things, just the first. I came to call them the wood lights after a while, when it became clear this wasn't a freak incident. It seemed appropriate. To be honest, I have a hard time believing any of this, and I was the one it happened to. I can promise you, this is real though. Whatever this is, these things are out there, lurking in the darkness and chasing the light. I don't know what they are, where they've come from, or why they're only revealing themselves now, but the fact of the matter is, they are. That's why I'm telling this. People need to know that these things live out there. They need to know so they can be prepared if they ever see them. Even if none of you believe this story, at least I tried to warn you. For those of you who want to know more, I'll leave all of you with this piece of advice. Stay out of the woods at night. If you can't stay out of the woods, stay out of the light. And if you can't stay out of the light, Pray to whatever god you believe in, but they do not find you. This story comes from my grandmother, who was told it by her father, Neil Franklin, who used to be a Nanuku County deputy. In April of 1925, the knocking began. People, especially those nearest to and in the deep forests of the county, began to hear someone knocking at their doors at odd hours of the night. Some of those people reported odd activities, but nothing was or could be done about it. Telephones weren't common this far out, and the people reporting the knocking lived in forest cabins and the like far out of normal patrols for the deputies. Then, people started disappearing. My grandmother was never sure who vanished first, but the first one Neil told her about was Ronald Flynn, a local hunter and trapper. A local butcher got a hold of the sheriff when Flynn didn't show up for his weekly supplies from the butcher. Neil and his partner was sent down to talk with the butcher the next morning. The butcher was pretty anxious about the whole thing, from what I've been told. Flynn didn't keep much in the way of supplies at his cabin, didn't want bears or something, so he would be nearly out of everything but meat he'd hunted by now. The butcher wanted them to check out the cabin 
to make sure he wasn't hurt or something. They agreed, but had the butcher accompany them and show them the way to the cabin. The hike took over an hour from the closest road, narrow deer trails, the only path they could take. The forest was a bit empty, but otherwise fairly normal, with birds calling and insects buzzing about. When they found the cabin, at first, nothing seemed out of place. The cabin was rough cut logs, maybe 10 feet to the side, with a single window and two doors, one in front, the other in the back. The front door was shut tight as the trio approached it and wouldn't budge when they tried to open it, apparently locked. The window was shuttered for a storm, but the back door was wide open. The cabin's interior was mostly undisturbed, only a plate of moldy food at the table and a pushed back chair breaking the cleanliness of the small room. It looked like he had just walked off in the middle of dinner. Counting the cans of food left, they were able to figure out he had been gone three days or so. And then they realized something. His boots and coat were set next to the front door, and the butcher said he only had one of each. The whole situation had an eerie feel to it, like they had been watched the whole time they searched the cabin. Neil and the others decided to leave the cabin and get back down to town as quickly as they could. The report of Flynn's disappearance took Neil and his partner the rest of the day to make, as each time they reread the report, it sounded crazy. Finally, they made bullet points of the facts and called it quits. Flynn was the first, but by no means the last vanished woodsman. Over the next few weeks, Neil and the other deputies dealt with reports of a dozen other people in the area, always with the same scene, like they had simply gotten up and wandered into the forest without any outdoors clothes. The sheriff plotted where the people had vanished from on a map of the county and tried to figure out where they could have gone. No one liked what was in the center of the circle the points made. Hoover's Mill After the last logging camp and mill closed in 1923, the county was left with a dozen empty sites and nothing to do with them. Vagrants, tramps and bums would often use the camp bunkhouses as flop houses, even after the railroad stopped running regularly through the region. One of the deputy's duties was to patrol the crumbling camps and chase off any squatters on the premises. However, there was one place that they really didn't like to go to. Hoover's Mill Hoover's was the first mill to close, being the deepest into the woods and the hardest to reach by truck. A winding dirt track, narrow enough to scrape the paint on an automobile, was the only access to the mill. The mill itself was in a clearing by one of the myriad small creeks in the region to power the saws and to transport the logs from upriver to it. According to my grandmother, the place just had an off feeling about it, like someone was watching you from the forest's edge. Thankfully for the deputies, even the most desperate people thought twice about trying to stay in Hoover's Mill. With nothing else left to go on, the sheriff got a group of deputies and some townsfolk to check out the old mill. They decided to go in the morning so they had as much light as possible. No one wanted to be anywhere near the mill when dusk came. Every man came armed with whatever weapons he owned that morning, and the group slowly walked down the overgrown path to Hoover's mill. My grandmother, who always emphasized that, unlike the walk to Flynn's cabin, the forest around Hoover's mill was silent as the tomb, no birds chirping and nothing moving among the trees. 
two men turned back before getting to the mill, citing nerves. Every man who stayed was on edge the whole way down the path, their guns swinging wildly at noises only they heard. When they finally reached the dilapidated mill, the exterior wasn't wrong at all. Just a handful of buildings falling apart along the clearing's edge and the peeling facade of the main mill. The men split up to check the outbuildings, but no one found anything but rusted tools and rotting bunks. That only left the mill itself. By now, the men were feeling a little better, having found nothing disturbing in the outbuildings. So, they walked to the front entrance of the mill, with at least some confidence. That immediately changed when they found the chain binding the door shut had been cut, from the lack of rust, recently. The mill's interior was wrong somehow. That's what Neil told my grandmother, and that's what she told me. He described it as counting how many pennies you have, and each time ending up with a different number without adding any or taking any away. Beams of light streamed in through gaps in the boards of the walls, giving the men a dim gloom to see. Rusted equipment was strewn about the floor, making the men carefully step over and around them as they went deeper inside. If the forest was quiet, the mill seemed to absorb sound, making the men's voices small and tiny, even to their own ears. They were so perturbed by the place that Neil nearly tripped over the first body. Neil had nearly tripped over a leg, Sitting against one of the massive saws was the remains of someone. Though, no matter how close Neil looked at it, he couldn't figure out who they were. Not because they were rotting or because the body was damaged. He couldn't even say if the person wasn't one of the missing people. As the other men gathered around the body after Neil called out to them, they all agreed they couldn't identify the body, but none could figure out why. They could describe the face well enough. White man in his thirties, brown beard and balding. But the face rung no bells to any of them. Even the men who knew some of the missing people couldn't say if it was one of them or not. They fanned out and soon found more bodies. Some were men. Some were women, and the bodies ran the gambit in race and age. But no one could tell who was who. Worse, none could determine how they had died. Even the young doctor from New York, Emerson, it was like they had simply sat down and never gotten back up. The men determined they were the only things living in the building and quickly left the discomforting interior of the mill. Outside, they began to argue what to do with the unidentifiable bodies. Some, among them the doctor, wanted to haul them back to town to see if anyone could figure out their identities, while others wanted to simply burn the whole mill to the ground and end this nightmare place once and for all. The sheriff and almost all his deputies stood with this group. And finally, the others relented to what was quickly becoming inevitable. The men gathered dry wood and tinder from around the clearing until they had a sizable pile in front of the mill. They created some rough torches and threw them into the mill before lighting the main pile again. Not a word was said in eulogy of the corpses found inside, since if they weren't sure if they even knew the people, what could they say? The fire raged through the mill for hours, but never spread to the surrounding trees, it never seemed to smoke despite the paints and chemicals that must have been inside. Finally, the fire began to wane 
as the afternoon sun was getting low, and the men hurried away from this twisted place, hoping to never see it again. Most of the men who had been there moved away from Nanuku County after that, but Neil stayed with a few of the others, including the doctor from New York, Emerson. He told my grandmother this story when she was young to keep her out of the forest, but my grandmother had a continuation to the story. Neil passed away in 1952, but she didn't forget the tale even after he was gone. So, in 1958, when people started reporting odd knockings at all times of the day to the sheriff, she started warning people about what had happened in April 1925, though few believed her. When the first people disappeared, people began to remember my grandmother's warning, and some started to panic. They started calling at all hours of the day to her home, and demanding answers she didn't have. A town meeting was called at Hyde's Parish for my grandmother and anyone else from that first occurrence of knocking could try to explain what was going on. It was my grandmother and Emerson, now the county's eldest doctor, to explain as best as they could. She told everyone assembled the story her father had terrified her with as a child and Emerson filled in some blanks as was needed. After they spoke, and couldn't answer where the knocking came from, the sheriff gathered a dozen men, including my grandfather, to check out the clearing where Hoover's Mill once was in the morning. My grandmother never really found out what the men found in the clearing, just that there were bodies in the footprint of Hoover's Mill. All that was left of the place was its cracked and eroded foundations, but every body laid neatly within those bounds. Again, no one could identify the corpses, despite being able to describe them. This time, however, the men brought the bodies back in the bed of their trucks to see if anyone could identify them. My grandfather hoped that the problem was the clearing not the bodies themselves. This was not to be. Every person who looked at the corpses was able to describe them, but even those closest to the missing couldn't positively identify them. The bodies were buried in a long row of graves, with a single headstone listing the people who had gone missing sat in the middle. An odd tradition began after the knocking of 1958. Every house, no matter how small or run down, had either a doorbell installed or a bell next to the door. No one knocked anymore, under any circumstances. People new to the area were given a story of a killer who knocked to lure people out of their homes to explain the odd custom. So, when in 1983, the knocking started again, no one vanished into the forest. Instead, the sheriff was called and he gathered his deputies and duly went down the ever more overgrown path to Hoover's Mill. They found people they guessed were transients, since no people had been reported missing locally. These people were gathered up and buried next to the other unknown people the knocking and the mill had taken. I told you this story to tell you another, more pressing one. I'm house-sitting for my parents while they're out of state, and someone's been knocking at my door for the last hour. <laughs> 